welcome to the Thin Places Travel Podcast, where we discuss places where the veil between this world and the eternal world is thin. I'm your host, Mindy Burgoyne. One of the beautiful things that's happening right now is that the energies of many, many sacred places are opening up again, having been closed for many, many centuries, I believe. Coming up, we'll hear from Dolores Whalen, a great spiritual teacher who lives at the foot of the Cooley Mountains in County Louth. She'll talk to us about the accessibility of the other world dimensions within the sacred landscape. Dolores Whalen is one of the most amazing people I've ever met. And if you travel in the Celtic spirituality circles and mention her name, it will almost always be recognized. Uh, It seems she's always been a teacher and an educator. She is certainly one of the most educated people I've known. At one time, Dolores was a biochemistry lecturer, and she holds a master's degree of science from Trinity College, Dublin. She also holds a master's degree in spirituality from the Institute for Community Collaborative Studies in Monterey, California. And now she is an author and she is a lecturer on spirituality. She leads pilgrimages to the sacred places in Ireland and to Iona in Scotland. And Dolores has written extensively on education and creativity and Celtic spirituality. She's facilitated workshops and retreats on Celtic spirituality and personal empowerment for over 25 years. Her most recent book, Ever Ancient, Ever New, Celtic Spirituality in the 21st Century, explores the wisdom of the Celtic tradition through the Celtic year calendar. Well, we are very happy to have Dolores Whalen with us today. I met Dolores years and years ago at a Celtic conference and was so impressed with her then. But since then, she's done a lot of work in exposing the sacred spots in Ireland and ways that we can enrich the, ourselves with Celtic spirituality and understanding the concepts of Celtic spirituality. So welcome, Dolores. We're so glad to have you. Thank you, Mindy. It's a delight to be speaking with you. Well, you know, I was reading a little bit about your background, which is amazing. Can you talk a little bit about how you went to America and all of your education and it led you right back to where you are doing what you're doing? Yes. Well, it was an amazing journey. I went to Canada in 1982. I had been teaching for 10 years in the Dundalk Institute of Technology, teaching biochemistry. I needed a break. I needed a change. I went to Canada, to Edmonton, and had a very interesting, if challenging, year there. And in May of the following year, I met Matthew Fox, who I didn't know anything about, but was drawn to go to his talk. And when I went to his talk, I was blown away by it. It was what I'd been waiting all my life to hear. And I'd never heard anybody bringing together spirituality and politics, spirituality and art, spirituality and social justice, and all the things that I was actually passionate about myself. So I knew with the greatest clarity in my mind that I had to go and study with him. And making that decision allowed it to happen. And my parents very graciously lent me the money to go and I went to California and spent two years at the Institute for Creation-Centered Spirituality. And I did a master's degree there and met some quite extraordinary people. I mean, people like Matthew Fox, Brian Swim, Thomas Berry, Starhawk, MC Richards. I mean, all these extra, Rollo May. The program was just an amazing program. And this was in the 80s, which was hugely cutting edge. So at the end of that year, I had a dream and I knew from the dream that I couldn't go back into my teaching in Dundalk IT, that that wasn't my path. So I made the decision to resign from that job. I never would have made that decision if I was living in Ireland, but in California, everything seemed more possible. And so I did. And I stayed on and studied massage and psychosynthesis and all kinds of amazing things. And in 1985, I came back to Ireland. And to say that I felt like I had um, fallen off my paradise world into the abyss is not an understatement. (laughs) It was just an amazing experience. Ireland was in the middle of a big recession. Everybody looked so poor and so white and so unhappy. And uh, it was a really difficult place to come back to. And part of me said, well, why don't you just go back to California? You have loads of friends there and you've got a community there that understand what you're about. But there was something much deeper that insisted that I stayed. I didn't have language at that time for any of what I subsequently discovered. So I came back and it was so amazing how spirit put 
everything into place, little by little by little. And each step brought me towards what it was that I was going towards, but had no real idea about it. I often think about how, you know, it was Steve Jobs who said, you know, we can only connect the dots retrospectively. And that is so true because really I was just being led one step to the next person, to one person and so on. But over the years, things began to unfold. And we, myself and another woman called Imelda, we brought Matthew Fox to Ireland in 1986. And all the mystics kind of emerged out of closets and came. And we had an amazing experience over two weeks with him giving workshops and seminars. And that began to create somewhat of a community of spiritual seekers. And in 1986, I also decided to um, set up a very small, very modest centre in one room in my house and offered courses there. And that eventually blossomed into what we called the Umlanu Centre for Healing and Creative Living. And the word Umlanu is an Irish word, which means wholeness. And for me, the journey was about wholeness. And I really believed that if my life could change by the experience I had of really powerful information and studies, then so could everybody else change. And that was my mission in a way, not in a kind of a zealous way, but, you know, but not in a kind of a controlling way. But I believe that because my life was changed so much by the amazing teachings that I learned, that if I could share those teachings, other people could learn and could change. And that was the experience. And that's over 30 years ago. I still meet people who will say to me, I came to a course in your center and it changed my life. I didn't change their life. They changed their life. I was the conduit for the information that they were ready to hear because when the student is ready, the teacher always appears. So Mm -hmm. it wasn't like that I did it. I didn't do it. I offered an opportunity and opportunity favors the prepared minds. And so many people came and had wonderful experiences and we built a tremendous community and we are still friends and that's very beautiful. Yeah, that's great. That's a wonderful story. If you were to talk to someone and say, try to describe the sacred landscape of Ireland in particular, and it's uh, this whole concept of thin places or liminal spaces where you have this sort of mingling of two worlds. How would you describe that? Well, that's a wonderful question, Mindy. And my introduction to liminal places was facilitated by being asked to travel with a Native American Indian woman called Diani Wahoo in 1988 around sacred places in Ireland. Now, I had very little experience myself. And what was really amazing was to be in her presence because she was so aligned. And actually, it was the first time I went to some of the very important places, including Ishnak, where the big Bialtana celebration will be on this Saturday coming up. But my sense was when I started going to sacred places, I was very much in my head. I was very much trying to figure it out. So what happened here? and Why is it? And so on and so forth. And people who were much more, I suppose, spiritually attuned to the land than I was at that time would say things like, oh, wasn't the energy here amazing? And I would look at them and have no idea what they were talking about because I couldn't feel it Mm -hmm. because I was trying to figure it out. So here's the thing, the most important piece of advice that we can give to anybody coming to the sacred places in Ireland, and there are so many of them, is first of all, get out of your head, drop into your body. Uh, learn to ground yourself in the place by having your feet firmly on the ground. And remember, we have two ears and one mouth because we need to listen. When you go to these places, instead of constantly asking questions, allow yourself to sink down and just allow the place to speak to you. So that's the kind of advice. So what is a liminal place? Well, a liminal place is a place where the veil between this world and the other world is thin. It's a place where we can access what's called the animi loci or the soul energy of a place. Not every place has that energy available, but the ancient peoples who lived in this country understood that not every place had the same energy and they chose the places with strong spiritual energy. These were the places where they built their temples, their monuments, their sacred places. And it's a very interesting thing because 
the energy of the place responds to the respectful presence of the visitors who come there. So, for example, if I go to the Hill of Tara, or if I go to Ishnok, or if I go to Fahard, wherever I go to, it is as I go to that place that I will find that place. If I go with them, um, oh, this is another place to tick my box with, say, I've been there. You may not experience very much because the energies are very sensitive. And one of the beautiful things that's happening right now is that the energies of many, many sacred places are opening up again, having been closed for many, many centuries, I believe. So when we go there respectfully and we ask permission to come in and we walk with our feet firmly on the ground and our hearts open, we will notice that we are being met by the energies of this place. And it's a reciprocal arrangement. As we go there with respect, the energy meets us with respect. And as we go, we, if you like, coax that energy out of its hiding place. And when we do that, the energy is stronger and more easily felt. So that if you go there the next day, that energy will be slightly more available. At this time on the planet, I believe that our sacred places are going to be one of the important places where we can get nurtured for the journey ahead. So going there with respect, I go to Fahart, which is just a few miles from where I live. That's Bridget's birthplace. I go there very often. I have never been there that there hasn't been other people there too. It's a place where when you walk in that place, there's something very calming and comforting. It's like a blanket. It's like Bridget putting her mantle around you and allowing you to know that all is well at a very deep level. That's great. So let's just extend on that a little bit more. I had a guest on a tour ask me this question and it was the best question I ever got. And I didn't really have a great answer. I fumbled all around until I said enough that she stopped asking. (laughs) But she said, you know, we were standing at Kill Kill Stone Circle in West Cork. And she said, oh, I feel this energy. What do I do with it now that I have it? Now that I'm feeling it, what do I do? And I never thought of it in those terms, but I think a lot of people that are approaching thin places, especially if it's a new thing to them, that's what they're wondering. You know, if I feel this thing, how is it helping me? Or can I use it to help others? Or they want uh, some type of action verb attached to it. So if she had asked you that question, how would you answer it? Well, that's a really wonderful question, first of all. And I don't think there's one particular answer to that question. One of the things that I had to learn, and I had to learn this, I suppose, in a challenging way. Sometimes when we get something new, we want to rush out and share it. But we give it away before we make it ours. So what I would say to anybody asking that question is, first of all, allow yourself to experience it deeply without having to do anything with it. Allow it to be. That energy has come to you as gift. So accept the gift and allow it to be integrated into who you are. And your presence there and that the presence of that energy will work its way within your soul. And in time, you will be able to share it with other people. That is a great answer. Um, I had your book before you gave me your book. <laughs> we saw you last year on tour. But when your book came out, I got it right away. And the book is Ever Ancient, Ever New, which we'll have in our show notes. But one of the things that I read in that book that really stuck with me, and it was right in the beginning, and I'd love for you to talk about it, was that I think it was that we've been influenced by maybe the Roman way of thinking. But mm-hmm. our way of thinking is different to the way the ancient people thought. And while that might sound obvious, the way you described it really reveals how this new way of thinking has almost blocked our sensitivity to what came as very natural to the ancient people. Absolutely. The ancient people of this country, like all primal people, understood that the earth was sacred. They understood that they came out of the earth, gave birth to them. It held them, it nurtured them. And in the end, they were returned to that earth. The ancient people also understood that there was no separation between this world and the other world, that there was an actual way in which the physical world emerged out out of the spiritual world. The visible world emerged out of the invisible world and that 
you know, one of my great teachers, Sean O'Din, who died actually in October of last year, he was just one of my great teachers and a wonderful man. And he's talked about re the God of the elements. And he talked about how the divine mystery it was always available to us in the physical world, but it was always expressed through something visible, like a river, a tree, a plant, a piece of earth. They didn't think in turn, oh, this is spiritual and this is secular. That didn't exist because for them, the entire world was spiritual and the physical world was the physical manifestation of the spiritual energy. Now, that is not exclusive to Irish, to Irish or to the to Ireland. That is the thinking of all primal people. And that way of thinking meant that you lived in right relationship with the earth. It is one of the principles from which or value systems that people held and from which they created their lives. The concept of relationship is hugely important in all primal peoples and was so here in Ireland. And so the legal or the justice system was based not on legalism, but on right relationship. And if the relationship was broken through misconduct, that relationship had to be restored. Their justice was a restorative justice system, not a punitive as ours is. Now, the relationships between the people and the land was hugely important. And that was embodied in the king. Now, the king was, if you like, the mediator between the people and the divine world. That when the king was inaugurated, the king could only accept his kingship when he went through a ritual with the, local, the goddess of the land, the local goddess. And in that ritual, he entered into a covenant with the goddess of the land through what was called the banished re, or the wedding of the king. The wedding of the king meant that the king vowed or committed himself to live in right relationship with the goddess of the land. And if he did that, then the land was bountiful, the people were happy, and justice reigned. If he did not obey or continue to live his vow, then the land became unfertile and he had to resign. Now, to me, that is the most wonderful piece of ancient thinking that we need to recover. Because what changed as time evolved was the understanding of, our, of the importance of our relationship with the land. And as we know, we live in a very dysfunctional relationship with the land, where we see the land as something that we take from all the time and that we dump back our, our rubbish into. We see it as an acquisitive, we have an acquisitive relationship with the land. What can I get from it? Way back in the ancient times in Ireland, there were two tribes who were constantly in battle with each other. And one were the Fomorians, and their king was Balor of the evil eye. And the other was the two of the Danan, the people of the goddess Dana. And the difference in these two tribes was a center for contention, and it still is within the world we live in. So for the Fomorians, they looked at everything with, a, as John Moriarty would say, Valor's destructive eye, where all they saw was, what can I get from this? The material, the financial value of something. They did not see into the spiritual essence of it. On the other hand, the two of the Danan were the people who saw into the spiritual essence of everything. And they understood that their job was to respect that. In the great battle of Magtura, a mythological battle, the battle was between the Fomorians and the two of the Danan. There was a kind of a hung, it was not a clear outcome. So the Fomorians took charge of the land, the two of the Danan went into the other world. And in a way, that retreating of the two of the Danan into the other world was the root cause of the kind of cross relationships which over the millennium we have developed with the earth. And so our job now is to call back the two of the Danan dimension because both the Fomorians and the two of the Danan are, um, they are dimensions of our consciousness. So we need to draw those back, the two of the Danan consciousness back into our awareness so we can rebalance our fairly dysfunctional relationship with the earth.
so expanding on that, do you think it's possible for people when they go to these, let's say they approach a sacred space the way you described, you know, falling into their body, approaching with respect, sensing the energy, allowing that to penetrate their own being, and then sort of giving back, you know, re, in that relationship between them and the energy that is there, something new happens, right? So yeah. do you think that it's possible that in that exchange or in that relationship that a, a human being or a pilgrim or whatever you want to call them would have with this sacred space, does that create an exponential third kind of energy that can heal the land? I've heard that quite a lot. In other words, this calling back, as you say, of the two hooded Anon energy or consciousness. When we as humans go and do that, is that in itself something that takes on a sort of power of its own? Kind of like prayer. You know, if you pray about something, maybe it will happen. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I think the answer is yes. Because the more we go to the sacred places and the more we experience the presence of spirit at them, we become changed. We become more sensitive. And as we live our daily lives, we can no longer, I think, as easily allow the destruction of our planet. It's like a non-causal reality, you know, it's like, so if I go to Tara, if I go to La Cruz, if I go to any of the amazing places in Ireland, and the thing about it is, the wonderful thing is that there are so many of them still alive and active in Ireland, that when we're walking in those places, and when we have those experiences, it changes our relationship with the land. I believe it does. And I, so I think, yes, I don't think this is going to happen in a week or a month. I think it's a slow process. But remember, if you think about how the um, agricultural revolution took thousands of years, the industrial revolution took um, hundreds of years, the informational revolution took very little time, everything is speeding up. And because there are more and more people going to these places, not only in Ireland, but all over the world, this awareness of the sacredness of the planet has the potential to happen very quickly. I am an optimist, and I'm sure you would say that that was, is obvious, given the massive destruction that is happening in the planet. And I believe that, you know, it is better to light a candle than curse the darkness. So I can't go to the Amazon and stop all that. I can't go to even some of the places in Ireland where they want to do fracking in near sacred places. I was hugely involved in the campaign to stop the M3 driving through the middle of Tara. It didn't succeed. But what happened was quite interesting because because of the worldwide controversy about that motorway, Tara has become a place that people know about and know about the controversy. And so in, a, in an obtuse way, th these, everything we do helps to create a different reality. I believe that we are on the brink of a breakthrough of human consciousness. I don't know if we'll get through, but if we do, it will be wonderful. If we don't, I am happy to be living my life this way with respect for the planet, which I love so much. So that's beautiful. Let me ask you, this is an outsider, somebody that is an American that has been coming to these places um, for many years. Could you comment on this, on my thoughts here? What I'm amazed about with Ireland in particular, and I guess I have traveled more to these liminal places than most Americans have. So my perspective might be, I have a little more experience um, behind it, but I went to France a couple of years ago. I guess I was doing, wanting to do a tour in Brittany. So I had my Ireland tour. I think I had two of them right in a row. And then my husband and I went off to Brittany to just kind of tour that with a guy there, Wendy Muse, who does a lot of touring around the sacred sites there. And I spent four or five days and it's just, you know, saw these amazing sites in Brittany. And I love Brittany and think it's wonderful. But I had to come back to Ireland to catch my flight to go home. And I had this overwhelming <clears throat> sense when we landed back in Ireland um, of just a relief of coming back to a place where these thin places were so much more accessible than they were in Brittany. I mean, it, in Brittany, it's, um, it's, it, is, it is wonderful, but there's so much uh, industrial agriculture going on. The, when you're not in the thin places, the um, landscape looks like it would in Maryland's Eastern Shore. It doesn't look much different than where I live. But 
obviously the thin places are great. But when you come back to Ireland, there are so many more of them. Um, and the attitude is they're everywhere. Just try planning a tour around them. If I try to plan a tour in another country, it's, it's just picking out little tiny places in the landscape that you have to get to. But in Ireland, you could take one county and do a 10 day tour in one county. Why do you think, what is it about the Irish consciousness that has managed to preserve so many of these sites and not pick up the rocks and put them in buildings or run over them over the years? And all of those transitions you talk about, with the invasion um, of the various tribes, with the you know the British occupation, with the you know the Great Hunger, all of this stuff has impacted Ireland. Yet that one constant has remained the same: this sort of reverence to these sacred sites. Why would you say? What can you comment on that? Why do you think that is? Well, that's a really good question and I have thought about that quite a lot myself too. I think there are many factors that would influence that and one of them is that Ireland was, if you like, Ireland was colonised in many different ways. It was colonised by by Christians before most other places and it was a beautiful, I mean the Christianity that came to Ireland initially was the from the desert, from the Egyptian, from, it was a very different. We didn't have the Roman Christianity until much, much later. But we traveled, but we didn't colonize. We went out and we colonized mines, but not countries. But going back to your, your question, we had the golden age of Celtic Christianity in Ireland uh, in the in the first I suppose up till about the 900 ADs at that time Europe was in a dark place it was very dark it was called the dark ages but in that time the Christianity that took root in Ireland was firmly built on the pre-Christian Celtic and the pre-Celtic Bronze Age, megalithic, all of those waves of um, of culture that were already in Ireland. We didn't seem to need to destroy what went before. And I think that's a very important thing. Roman Christianity tried to do that, but it didn't succeed. It may have succeeded, in, to, it succeeded to some extent, but the older customs always found their way into it. This is the 21st century. People still go to holy wells. People still high, uh, hang ribbons on the, the hawthorn tree. People, I had dinner with a neighbour and a friend of mine last night, and she said, oh, I threw the flowers up on the roof. I hadn't done that because I was waiting to do it today. But you throw the flowers up on the roof to bring Bialthana, the season of summer, into your house. These, and I use the word pagan, pre-Christian customs, are still alive, not in vast ways, but they're still alive. And here's the thing that I think happened. Things went to the point of almost extinction and then came back. A wonderful example of this is Irish music. In the 40s and the 50s in Ireland, Irish music was not remotely popular. It was not seen as something you'd want to be doing. And it was almost on the verge of extinction when many people began to gather it back. We have the same, and, and oh, the way gathering it back with people who put themselves out there on the edge to gather back something which was about to be lost. My own father was one of those people and many, many other people. Um, Eva Ann Boland, the, the great Irish poet, she said something that has informed my work an awful lot. She said, it is a foolish centre that ignores the margins, and it's the role of the margins to influence and redefine the centre. So they, each culture was way out on the margin, but the people who understood, some people who were whose destiny was to be the caretakers of the margins, worked with that and brought it back into the centre. That has been my own work all of my life. I've been on the margins for the last 35 years. <laughs> and that's okay because it's a really fertile place to be. But here's the thing. You, like when I went to Newgrange first, hardly anybody went there. And oh, that's another amazing gift I was given. Three times I was in Newgrange for the solstice wow. and three times the sun came in and I never applied for any tickets at any time. They were given to me. How amazing is that? Oh, that is amazing. 
that is amazing. But it's like so. So I was. I've been going to Shlita Nikolayak since 1990. We had a wonderful time with your tour yeah. last year. Beautiful day. But I went there with a small group of Americans in 1990, 1990, I think. And I just thought it was the most amazing place, but nobody was going there. And you got the key from under the house mm-hmm. of a man who was an electrician, and you came up and you went and left the key back. I was just like so <laughs> extraordinary. But w- that was that edge for that. There was a time when all of those things were about to die, but somehow the, the soul of the country, through the people who had been awakened, began to gather it back so it wouldn't get lost. I think that's what happened. Because I know that's what happened for me. Like, I had never been to any of those places until I started being guided to go there. And I went and I brought people and lots of my friends thought I was mad, daft, you know. But, you know, now, 30 years later, we as a people are beginning to acknowledge and own and love those sacred places. And one of my biggest concerns concerns at the moment is how we will manage to invite pilgrims in and yet hold the integrity of those places. This is a hugely important question at this time because, you know, it would be very easy to market, 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 get loads of busloads in and destroy the energy of those places. Because if we did that, the energy will retreat back in and, you know, we will not find it there and they will become like empty vessels. Yeah, that's um, that's true. That's why I love Ireland. Is there's so many that, I guess, the way Ireland sort of spent its tourism or invested in tourism was what fit at the time, which was to have these buses that took many people to places, and but you know, um, and that was right for the time, and it did give Ireland a lot of exposure. But I take these people to these, you know, these places not a lot of people go to, and what's interesting watching them. I, I took a group to Beltane Stone Circle, I think last year. And this was a group, uh, it was a large group for me. It was about, I don't know, 22 or 23 people. And you'll notice when you when you start taking groups around, they develop their own sort of dynamic. And when you get over 17 or 18 people, they begin to sort of fracture. They'll sort of hang in two groups rather than be one group. Mm-hmm. And this group had not gelled. They just hadn't. And this was probably day five. It was it was halfway through. And as we walked up to Beltane, uh, you know, you walk up this long path and then the stone circle is way out in a field and you walk across that field. And they all did that. And we stayed there for almost an hour mm-hmm. and no one spoke a word. Oh, Not wow. one of these people. I just waited for the first person to talk, just timing it because it was almost like an experiment for me thinking, what has happened here? Mm. This is not like this group. Um, yeah, yeah. I had one of the most shy people in the group who happened to be, she was, a, she was into yoga. She got up in the center of that circle and just started with the yoga moves, which, which was beautiful, but it was so unlike her. Yes. So it was, yes. it was something to me, there has to be something that's there. Oh, that God. is inherently there that, that changes people and magnifies, it gets magnified or amplified the more people that are tuning in at the same time. And I suspect they all just kind of did that and it expanded. Oh, it opened a portal. Yeah, what do you think about that? What is a portal and where, how do you, um, how do you know? It's a door. I think you don't know cognitively. I think you know intuitively. Like, I don't know any of the stuff I talk about. At a, a, when I bring, I had a beautiful group uh, about two weeks ago on Tara, small group. I had no idea what I was going to say at any of the places we stopped in Tara. We had the most wonderful wonderful rich experience you know but it's not like you know and I, I as I said when I started going there first I didn't really know how to be in those places and I was trying to figure it out but more and more and I just go when I prepare myself it's more about becoming empty of my of the noise in my head and my agenda and to say I'm asking this place this site to speak through us to speak to us and to speak through us. And so whatever we do is, and whatever we do, whatever we, however we pray. And yes, it is a place. 
the, the vibration of the place starts to move through each of us. And you're right, when we gather as a circle uh, with a, uh, the number, greater number of people, when they become aligned and in harmony, then that be creates a resonance. You see, the whole thing of morphic resonance, that creates a, a, a resonance of, of a spiritual energy that will allow things to open more fully. Yeah. Look, uh, you almost talked about this and then I steered you in a different direction. But do you think, actually, I know you probably do think this, but could you comment on how that energy of a place can impact creativity in a person that visits there? Oh, that's it. That's yeah. Well, I think I'm not sure that it's directly creativity, but what is it? What does it mean to be creative? To be creative for me means to follow your allurement, to follow your passion, to to do what you came here to do, to follow your destiny. And so to be creative is to allow the, you see, we're all creative. To be creative is our total birthright, our soul's journey but we get distracted. So I think healing happens for people at sacred places. Um, and when that healing happens, we become more fully aligned. And as we become more fully aligned, we're able to work with the flow of our lives. We all came here with particular work to do, with particular paths to walk. But so often we get caught up with the busyness of life. We get caught up, our energy get blocked, gets blocked with all the things that hurt us, that didn't work and all that stuff. But when we go to a place like Taran, Newgrange, Slivna Kaliak, Bialtana, Beltane Circle, wherever we go, and we see that place has been there for thousands of years, simply doing what it came here to do. Maybe we get some kind of an insight that that's what we're meant to do too, to do what we came here to do. I love John O'Donoghue's poem where he says, it's called a morning offering. He said, let me have the courage today to live the life that I would love, to postpone my dream no longer, but do what I came here to do and waste my life on fear no longer. I think that's, you know, the healing that can happen at the sacred sites releases us from the fear which binds us and allows us to align ourselves with our destiny. Hmm, that's great. That's powerful. Um, I, I wouldn't want to not ask you to talk about Bridget um, during <laughs> since, since that is definitely part of your mission. Can you talk a little bit about all that you're doing with uh, the legacy of St. Bridget? Well, <clears throat> I always say that I went to, to visit Bahard in 1992, I think it was 1992, and Bridget hasn't let me go since. Um, I didn't grow up with any great devotion to Bridget, but I, I suppose the times that we live in, there is a huge awakening of our connection with the divine feminine. And Bridget, in both her Christian saint and her pre-Christian and pre-Celtic goddess forms, holds the energy of the divine feminine within the tradition of this country. So connecting with Bridget is connecting with the central story, the central spiritual story of this country. And as such, it's, it's like it's seminal. You can't talk about the spirituality of this country without speaking about Bridget. Um, as I said, in, in 1992, I went there. I didn't really know much about it and about Bridget, really. But over the years, I've become so connected with her energy. And I love the fact that she works through me and with me in everything that I do. And so in, in 2004, a few, oh, in 1993, I was in Kildare when the Brigidine sisters relit the flame of Bridget, which had been lit for, I think it was uh, about 800 years until the suppression of the monasteries in, uh, under the Normans, I think it was. Um, and they relit the flame of Bridget in 1993. I was at that event and I knew deep in my soul that something significant was happening. Um, years later, I um, was involved with um, a small group of people and we decided to organise a festival to celebrate Bridget of Fahard. 
and myself and my dear friend Maura, on the first morning of the festival, we traveled to Kildare, to the Brigidines, and we took a light from that flame which they had lit, and we lit our flame in Fohard. And we have done a festival for the last 11 years over the time, um, over the period of Imbolc, which is at the beginning of spring, to celebrate Bridget of Fohard. That festival has grown and become quite an important celebration of Bridget in all of her forms. She, we celebrate Bridget as Earth Woman, Bridget as Soul Smith, Bridget as um, poet and artist, and Bridget as healer. And we do that in a very creative um, festival, a very creative festival, uh, which involves artists and poets and healers and visionaries and all of that. This year's festival, we had 25 events over 10 days, and the theme of the festival was Bridget, Muse to the Cultural Creative, which I believe was a hugely significant theme because at this time we need a new vision of, 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 of our culture and a new vision of what it means to be humans. And I believe that Bridget, in that, that energy of her, can hugely support us in that. Uh, in 2012, myself and a colleague, Karen Ward, were at a talk given by Anthony Murphy, and he talked about the alignment between Fohard and Kildare. Now, I had never heard of that, knew nothing about it. But Karen and myself started to talk, and we don't know which of us decided on the mad plan of organising a pilgrimage from Fard to Kildare, but that is what we did. And in 2013, we walked that nine-day pilgrimage from Fard Graveyard, Bridget's birthplace, to Kildare Town, the place of our monastery. And we've done that pilgrimage every year since then. So it's now in its sixth year, and we are doing it again this year. So those two major projects Projects which centre around Bridget have captured the imagination of many people who might have Irish ancestry and who are actually connecting with the divine feminine. And of course, she's one of the many manifestations of that divine feminine energy, which is insisting on coming back into our lives and being listened to and heard in our culture. So I've had a very intense journey with Bridget over the last um, 10 years, I would say. And um, I'm in the process of writing a book about Bridget. It's my intention to knuckle down to it very soon again. But yes, she is one of the most important energies that we need to connect with because she is the one who, I love what they say about Bridget at Imbolc, she breathes life into the mouth of dead winter. And in our culture right now, we have created a wasteland. And I believe that the energy of Bridget has the capacity to transform this cultural a desert, I suppose, barrenness into something much richer and much more beautiful than we've had in the past. Oh, that's that is very beautiful. And so we'll have the links to your pilgrimage as well as the festival in the show notes for people that want to know that. Yes. Um, tell me a little bit about your CD. Um, I didn't know you had a CD. Is that new? The the journey with through the Celtic year. I know I made it about seven or eight years ago. Uh, it, 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 I did it in the studio. It's, it's, not a, uh, it's not a live presentation. And in that CD, I travel through the Celtic year. I bring, I bring people, sorry, on a journey through the Celtic year on, me, on three different levels. So first of all, the seasonal then the mytholo mythological spiritual, then how this affects our personal, how personal um, journeys and how the Celtic year is a model for us to live our different journeys because we have um, the eight seasons. Each of those seasons is not just a period of time, but is a particular type of energy. And when you go through the eight seasons of the Celtic year, you're, you're walking and dancing, as it were, through eight different sea, uh, energies. And if you are able to embrace all of those as they appear in your life, you learn how to flow with life rather than fight against it. Hmm, that's great. I, I think your book, Ever Ancient, Ever New, um, is probably the most readable um, readable book for thin places that I've ever met. You know, but these people that I bring on tour, they're they're 
relatively um, new to the concept. We don't live in Ireland, so we're not walking sure. around you know, these, sure, these sure. awesome sites absorbing that our whole lives. But the Ever Ancient, Ever New book is just a great introduction to how, how to just connect with the way of thinking um, of the people from that land. So we'll, we'll put something up there about that as well. I, I'd just like to ask, if you were to advise people that were coming to Ireland, maybe on their own in search of these mystical places or liminal spaces, what advice would you give them about how to approach these places? Well, the most important advice I would give to Americans, and I say this with great respect, is slow down. <laughs> slow down. <laughs> I've had people, a friend of mine, bring in a group in. He said, we'll be arriving in Dublin Airport at 9 o'clock. We'll be in Tara at 12. And I'm going, you are mad, crazy. You need to, you need to actually come into the land and spend a day just being there. And then... One of the things that I discovered, and again, I would be very linear and very much time conscious. So, okay, we're going to be in this place at that time. And you don't know what time you're going to be in a place because the time is different in those liminal places. Like when I was in Tara a few weeks ago, um, Anne said to me, Taurus, it's four o'clock. And I'm going, it's what? We, I thought it was about half two, you know, because time is very different there. So what I would say is don't over plan your day. Allow yourself the gift of going to a few places and really being present there and bring a journal and, and, and you know, and write your reflections and just know that whatever places you get to will be right for you. We always end up where we meant to be. But like if you try to go to too many places, they just all run together. Yeah. yeah, they all run together. So, and you know, in something like Tara, which is a big site, you need to allow three or four hours. That might sound ridiculous, but if you're not going to run through it, that's what you need. Uh, I'd say to people to avoid new grains during the summer. It's just too busy. It's okay. too, too busy. And go to go to the lesser known places as well. Or go, you know, go to, I think what you what the best thing to do is Read, read something about the different places and see which ones draw you. That's what I would say. But mm -hmm. just give yourself time, slow down, and um, know that your soul is drawing you to those places and allow yourself the time and the space to have your soul connect with the soul of that place. That's what the word, uh, the word animai loci means, the soul of a place. Mm -hmm. So allow yourself, your soul, your anima, to connect with the animi loci of the place you're in. Great. So before we wrap up, is there anything else you'd like to say? The only thing I would like to say, I think, well, no, what I would like to say is we are living in times of extraordinary crisis. And the Chinese uh, symbol for crisis has two meanings, danger and opportunity. We're on a knife edge, I think, with, you know, with the planet and its evolution at this stage. I think that we as human beings have a wonderful opportunity to um, become part of the change that we want to see in the world. One of those ways is by walking graciously on the earth and coming to any country which has sacred sites and sacred places and doing your work there is part of healing the planet that's not, not so much healing the planet i take that back healing our relationship with the planet the planet is fine it's our relationship with the planet that needs to be changed and healed and so coming and walking in sacredness in the earth anywhere will affect how we walk and journey on the earth in our ordinary lives that's wonderful. Well, I want to thank you very, very much for this time. Thank you for being such a great teacher as well. You've offered, you. you've offered people so much when it comes to understanding the uh, sacredness of, especially in Ireland, the sacred sites. So thank you very much. And we will, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much, Mindy, for having me on your program. I'm delighted. And it was so lovely to meet you again last year. Yes, it okay. was. We'll see you again.
several of the sites mentioned by Dolores Whalen on this podcast will be sites on our 2019 tours of Thin Places, in particular the Hill of Tara, Newgrange, and Beltany Stone Circle. So stay tuned in our next episode because we'll be announcing the dates of the 2019 tours and a little bit more about what they will explore. We know already that there will be one tour to Scotland two tours to Ireland, and in the summer, we're going to have a surprise tour uh, to North America. So thank you for listening to this Thin Places Travel Podcast, and you can find us on the web at thinplacespodcast.com. You can also find me, Mindy Burgoyne, on Twitter at Travel Hags and on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Thin Places. If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a quick rating and review on iTunes and consider subscribing. In our next episode, our guest will be author Patricia Byrne, who will talk to us about the deserted village on Ackle Island. So long for now. <laughs>